know this is a finance or marketing class. So that's what I teach. Typically, it's a smaller room with only 25 students, but today, as many of you guys were, were coming, we got this bigger room. But uh, these sessions are always open for, you know, to everyone, right? So anyone can join. Right now, if you want to share. So before we start recording, yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. yeah. Want to share so thoughts or... I'll just say, uh, hi, everybody. Thank you for having me. Um, it's nice to be back on campus. I've never actually been in this uh, in this building as part of NYU, but I graduated. Looking around the room, I graduated uh, from Stern. I think before almost everybody here was born. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in two thousand one was my graduation here, so I actually even like looking around and seeing the, the purple and the logos and some of the the swag that you guys have on your desks. Um, it's uh, it brings me back, and I have a lot of pride in the time that I spent at uh, at NYU. I can talk a little bit about my background if you'd like yeah, me to. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, so quickly, so I, uh, I am now, I'm actually uh, moving into a new role, which we'll talk about uh, at Nestle Health Science. I've been with Nestle for uh, about 15 months. I started in September of 2023. Prior to that, I was with uh, Facebook and then Meta, the same company, both of you changed names. It's hard for me to say Meta. I don't know if you guys are more uh, familiar with Meta or Facebook, but I started in 2014 at Facebook, and so it's still Facebook to me, you know, a lot of it is. Um, and right about the same time we acquired Instagram and, and WhatsApp, actually, right around the time that I started, um, Meta now acquired both Instagram. If you haven't studied that story, it's amazing. A billion dollars acquisition price. And think about the, the current value of Instagram now. Probably one of the best uh, acquisitions uh, in the history of acquisitions. Um, WhatsApp is a little bit different. Uh, Facebook paid $19 billion for WhatsApp. Um, I think WhatsApp's a phenomenal service, but it's it's a difficult thing to monetize, right? You guys, I don't want ads kind of in my WhatsApp, you know, kind of mm -hmm. chats and so forth, but they are figuring out ways to uh, make it available to businesses. So there's just a couple of points. On, around the time that I started at Facebook, those acquisitions took place. Um, and prior to uh, Facebook, I won't go all the way back to my, my early days uh, coming out of Stern, but I worked at Pfizer, the drug company. Um, which was at the time right around the corner on the east side on 42nd Street. Um, and so I was a, a, a version of Pfizer, and I say a version because we went through a lot of uh, acquisitions and um, strategic partnerships with other pharma companies. So J&J, Roche, uh, Warner Lambert, which you may not even know of any longer. You might remember Warner Lambert, but Pfizer acquired Warner Lambert. Uh, Wyeth is another drug company that Pfizer acquired. And um, I was there for about 11 years in kind of varying degrees of, of marketing leadership roles from a brand manager all the way up to uh, a VP of marketing. And I took, I'll just, I'll add one more. Uh, we spent as a family five years in California. It's kind of the first time we, I grew up here on the East Coast and uh, we live on the East Coast, we live in Connecticut now, uh, but I worked and we lived in California for five years. Or I was the head of marketing for Callaway Golf Company which was a lot of fun because I like golf and uh, it was a smaller company. I went from Pfizer to, uh, to Callaway back to a different version of Pfizer with some of those acquisitions and, and so forth. And actually when I came back from California, that was my first uh, time being a CMO. So I was the chief marketing officer for Pfizer, consumer healthcare in the US, which was all consumer products. I've never really worked on, I work a bit today in Nestle Health Science on pharma products, products that require a prescription. Um, but the vast majority of my background has been consumer goods and consumer products. Super. So the bonus for those of you who are online or who join on time is that you get to see all that, right? So <laughs> yeah, that's a good lesson. So I'll go ahead and get started more um, for those of uh, you who are online. Um, my name is George Benaroya. I started my career at Procter & Gamble right after my MBA. Then I was in Tetra Pak for about 12 years by store of Nivea, and now working in private equity for about eight years in private equity. Now, once per week, in addition to work as a CFO, I get to do something I love, and that is to teach this class. Will you stop sharing for a second? So, so when you guys see, if you're online on the on your right, are students, right? So we're not actors and actresses. That's a different school, right? When you hear, you know, students from NYU getting Oscars, that's a thing. It's a different school, right? <laughs> <laughs> NYU, SPS, and these are the students. You will see later on in a video that typically in a smaller classroom, but um, basically these are the students that are in the class. Now, um, maybe uh, such a position is pretty good. I want to show them some of the slides that we have. If you go to the next slide, please. And the next one. 
So let me explain how the class works. On the first session, students pick a company, any company they want. Uh, we show them the Fortune 500 companies, and they said, no, no, we want Nestle. <laughs> now, Nestle is a Swiss company, and it's the largest food and beverage, uh, you know, our clients, what is the reason why we work there? And then what we do at the end of the, towards the end of the semester, this is session number 12, is we bring executives who are making those decisions to tell us how they do it in real life. And today we have with us Brian Gross. He's the chief marketing officer of Nestle, the largest company in the world, food and beverage company in the world. Now, I prefer to make presentations at a more personal level. And so one thing that I really like about inviting Brian to come is that, yes, you know, prior to this, he was the vice president at Meta for Facebook with global clients and global accounts. But yes, he was a CMO advisor for the consumer health business. But the other thing that he shared with me is that when he was working full time at Pfizer, he would then get on the subway, go all the way to NYU to study, right, and get a master's. And now you see what he's, uh, you know, managing now, billions of dollars. So on behalf of all the students, Brian, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. And so what we will do, and what we always do is students ask questions. Uh, I will just ask one in general, and then the students will be coming. It's great if you send us a question well in advance, because, for example, in this case, we get over 100 questions. And so, Brent, one of the questions that I would like to have is, uh, if you think in general about companies like Nestle or you know, uh, CPG companies, I try to teach our students about return on investments and return on marketing investments. Mm -hmm. Even about referrals, right? How powerful would be what consumer tells, uh, you know, another person that this is good in your care and so on. That is very, very powerful. But if you were to give them, uh, most of them are starting marketing, right? One or two tips on how to have a good relationship with a chief financial officer. What tips would you give them? Yeah, well, thank you. Um, actually, I'll start with a quick story back to my, my Stern days because I think it's actually um, relevant to this conversation. So, uh, Professor mentioned that uh, I used to take the subway from Midtown when I was working at Pfizer down to uh, the Washington Square campus. And it, those were long days. So, I was, uh, you know, early days in the office, two classes. I think there was a 5.30 and a 7.30 class or a 7.30 class. You guys may know. You may take some of those classes. Um, and so, you're back home at whatever it is, 1030 or something like that into bed and you do it the next day. Um, it was only two days a week, I guess, was my, my class. But what I used to say was because I was in the evening program at Stern, it was very few marketers uh, and very many finance uh, mm -hmm. people of my kind of age group and so forth. And so they would leave their desks. I actually think many of them went back to their desks after they took their two classes with us. But I was way behind all the time in the finance <laughs> classes. So I, I could have really used a... Uh, a finance for marketers kind of class because I was in the regular finance class and I was woefully behind in early, <laughs> early days. But I share that because um, today there's no better partnership that I have in my role as chief marketing officer than with our CFO. Um, he's a terrific guy, which is a big part of, I think, why we have a great relationship. Um, and what I would say about the partnership is that we kind of hold one another mutually accountable. As a CFO, you can imagine, you know, kind of very focused on the financial performance of the business. And one of the things that I like to say is that um, I'm in a partnership with our CFO. And so enrolling the CFO in the decisions that we're making as a marketing leadership team is critically important to make that person, he or she, it happens to be a he, in, in my case today, um, feel like a part of the decision making rather than kind of someone who's overseeing or coming in uh, part time. So one of the things I you know, think about as a marketer um, and we'll talk a little bit about the difference between marketing and what has been referred to as brand management uh, over time. And, and those are two different things, even though they're often kind of, you know, synonymous with, within organizations, but I'll come back to talk about that, is that um, enrollment and, and partnership with um, other functions across the business is, is critically important to make them feel like they're a part of it rather than living in your individual silo. So that's a big part, I think, of being a, a brand leader or a marketer. Um, and certainly as a CMO. The other thing that is not going to be a surprise to you is that um, the marketing function and the CMO role is now far more measurable than it ever has been. Mm -hmm. And so we have data and, and CFOs love two things. They love growth and they love data. <laughs> and so we have 
both, right? I think of marketing, I try to think of marketing and position our marketing investments as a growth engine for the business. Um, I think CFOs often, you can tell me, because I've never been a CFO, but get a bit of a bad rap as kind of cost cutters and so forth. There's nothing CFOs like more than top line growth, right? And if marketing can drive top line growth, we have to cut less and manage the, the business less. Um, but, you know, we focus on effectiveness and efficiency as marketers. And so I think of effectiveness as growing the top and efficiency is getting more out of your investments. So that return on your investment. And the more data driven you can be, we have a huge business at Amazon, about 40% of our revenue in Nestle Health Science is done through Amazon in the US, which is massive. Procter Gamble and Unilever and, and other parts of Nestle are 20% are or less. So in the supplement space where our business primarily is, is very heavy, you know, just based on consumer behavior and subscribe and save and things like that with Amazon. And um, Amazon's our most measurable market investment, right? We have the data in real time that proves to be a good way to bridge the relationship with the CFO. So enrollment and partnership, measurability, and, and again, if a CMO is doing her or his job well with the marketing organization, you are demonstrating that you're growing top line and that you're a growth engine, not a, a cost center, you're a growth center for the business, and that, that always makes for a better relationship with the CFO. Yeah, I think that's true. That's oh, Vanessa, you want to open the first question? Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. Hi. Hi, nice to see you. Yes. First of all, thank you so much for joining yeah. us, Mr. Okay. I'm Vanessa Sibeli, and my question is, uh, Nestle Health Science operating profit margin decreased in context of our business right now. So uh, for those that aren't aware, and I didn't expect you all to be aware, but uh, it's public information that we had a, a significant supply uh, challenge. We weren't able to produce many of the leading brands and goods to, um, to deliver to the U.S. market over the course of 2023. It began kind of late 2023 and is just now, frankly, you know, being resolved. And so we get a lot of questions from the investor community about our ability to supply you know, you almost take for granted as a marketer that supply is going to be there. But in supplements in particular, um, if you just think about um, categories like vitamins, uh, we have tens of thousands of SKUs, right, stock keeping units. Uh, whereas if you think about peanut butter or you think about coffees, you may have tens or in, in a, an extreme case, hundreds of SKUs. So we're producing tens of thousands of individual SKUs um, all the time. So it's a highly complex business to operate, if you will, from a uh, supply perspective. So that's the context. To answer your question, um, you know, it, it's not um, rocket science in terms of what we're going to do to bring uh, customers who we refer to as retailers. So our retail partners is how we think about customers and consumers are all of us, the end users of, of those brands. So I don't know if you studied Byron Sharp in any of your uh, marketing uh, work, but if you haven't, there's a really, there's two books called How Brands Grow. Um, it's how, how Grants grow, grow, excuse me, part one and part two, I think, okay. but Byron Sharp's an Australian uh, academic, and he talks about mental availability and physical availability. It's pretty, it's pretty straightforward, right? But you think about physical availability as we see this Nesquik or we see Vital Proteins or Garden of Life, some of the brands that, that we work on in SA Health Science, available either in your stores as you're walking through the stores or you, uh, they're physically available in the digital context if you're TikTok or you're on Instagram or you're on any of the other platforms, Amazon, of course, as well. And so that, that availability is a huge part, right? Sounds simple, but just being available is a huge part of um, how brands do grow based on kind of these philosophies from Byron Sharp and how brands grow. And then the mental availability is how you differentiate your brand from all of the others in the competitive space, right? And so we are doing some very basic things like preserving our shelf space at retail, uh, making sure that when we are fully back in stock, and we are essentially fully back in stock now, that we haven't lost those critical facings. And that's a huge, huge part of um, the four keys or any other part of physical availability that you've studied in marketing. 
And then from a marketing perspective, we are constantly, what I call always on, um, focusing on being in the right places at the right times, right? So for an audience like of you guys, right? You're not spending a lot of time watching um, primetime television any longer, I wouldn't think. I'm, I'm gonna make that assumption. Um, but you're on your phones quite a bit and I'm on my phone quite a bit. And so making sure that we are in the right places with the right messages, um, promoting at the right levels, pricing you mentioned earlier, George, I think is a, is a critical part of the conversation as well. Another one of the, of the keys, of course. But um, yeah, we're, we're investment um, spending to ensure that we build momentum back into these brands, both with our retail partners, where there's a cost to, um, to serve the retail community, and that's an investment that we need to make to preserve our, our placement at retail, or to, frankly, gain more um, advantage in terms of the retail placement. You can imagine, when we came out of the market with our supply challenges, a lot of the competitors want to go in and fill in that space, right? And so the ability to preserve your space or, or reserve the space to come back to is, is hugely important to us. So um, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a broad answer, but I think we are, um, we're in a really good place in terms of regaining um, momentum and trust as you talked about. I would say that the trust uh, has been a challenge on both the retail community side and, and the consumer side. Um, because the retailers count on us for their profitability, right? Their business is based on having consistent and high quality supply of the goods that, that consumers want. It sounds, again, very simple, but it is, uh, you know, when you don't have the supply, um, you don't have the physical availability, and you can't, you can't purchase the products. And so, um, yeah, we, we're building back. This will be a really important year for us. We've had a very good year in 2023, sorry, excuse me, 2024, coming off of 2023. And we just had a big moment, uh, Nestle Group, the, the large Nestle organization, had a big moment last week that we called Capital Markets Day, which is an investor community um, opportunity for the investors to really dig in on our, on our numbers and on our business and on our strategies. And so my boss, our leadership um, uh, in the US was in Switzerland telling the, the Nestle Health Science story. And, and that question was, was top of mind for every one of the investors that we spoke to. So we feel really good and, and optimistic and confident about our strategy for 2025 uh, around these big brands. Um, and a lot of it is in partnership with the retail community and, and differentiating ourselves as we come back to the market with consumers. Thank you so much. Sure. Sure. Oh, yes. Thank you. Hello, Mr. Rose. Hi. Again, thank you for coming. Yeah. I'm actually asking two questions that are related to the coffee. Okay. So the first question on behalf of Italian Shogi is, with a diverse portfolio, including Garden of Life, pure capsulation, and the vinyl proteins, how does Nestle position each brand to serve different customer needs? Are there cross-promotional strategies or shared resources, like research or distribution that drive growth? Yes, two great questions as, as that, um, I guess, two-part question. So Nestle Health Science is a relatively young um, portfolio for Nestle, so we've acquired uh, 17 or 18 brands over the past 10 years. Some of them are pharma brands. Some of them are what we call medical nutrition brands. Think kind of hospital products and feeding tubes. And then the majority of the 17 or 18 acquisitions have been consumer products. And so as the question lays out, we have multiple brands now in singular categories. So vitamins is, is maybe the best example. So we have Nature's Bounty, Pure Encapsulations, Garden of Life, Soldar are all vitamin brands that are, that are essentially competing for the wellness space. Um, we've done a lot of work around separating the brands, what we call kind of homeland demand spaces. We've done a lot of consumer segmentation work around different um, demographics, different psychographics, the reasons that people are taking, you know, or, or regularly taking supplements. And so Soldar, as an example, might be a brand that you're not as familiar with, um, is more about longevity. Um, Nature's Bounty is more about kind of everyday wellness, right? And so that is more of a, from a pricing perspective, you have um, kind of a good, better, best strategy. Um, we have a good, better, best strategy as well. And so Nature's Bounty would be probably the most value-oriented brand, although I'm pausing on saying that because I don't think of Nature's Bounty as a value brand. It really is a, a, a consumer uh, brand where there's a lot of love and a lot of the work that we've done to the last question um, around Nature's Bounty to bring that back into the market is around the emotional connection to uh, these supplements actually, you know, just building on the, the kind of innate powers of your body. And we're just kind of giving you that extra, that extra push. 
Um, Pure Encapsulations is another brand, which is really interesting one. So we've only begun distributing um, Pure Encapsulations to consumers through Amazon in the last couple of years. And the business has grown like crazy. So Pure Encapsulations was an acquisition that we made, actually I should know the years, probably, probably three to five years ago. Um, and it was uh, all of the heritage in Pure Encapsulations was built on pharmacists and, and healthcare professionals. So you could only get um, Pure Encapsulations uh, at the time through your uh, HCP writing essentially a, a prescription for it that you would pick up at the pharmacy counter. And so it's a premium brand. So a bottle of pure encapsulations magnesium, as an example, might cost 35 or $45. Whereas a nature's bounty magnesium, which is a different formulation for sure, um, would, would cost in the you know, teens, if you will, like you know, between 10 and $20. So yes, there's pricing um, differentiation. There is what we call demand space differentiation. We think a lot about how we innovate and where, you know, what would be the right innovation or next set of products for a pure encapsulations brand versus a nature's bounty brand. And so we're pulling them apart that way, but it is a big challenge for us. And again, it's something that comes up with the investor community quite a bit when they say, you've made all these acquisitions, are you competing with yourself, right? Well, so how do you pull them apart? So they're, they're, it's not all purely incremental, um, but it is, we have done a really good job, I think, of segmenting the business based on price and based on channel strategy. So some products, so Garden of Life, you mentioned as well, it's kind of grew up in the natural channel, right? And the independent uh, grocer channel. And now it is marketed much more broadly. And for a long time before the supply challenges that we have was the number one vitamin brand on Amazon. And so we were seeking to re reclaim that title, um, hopefully in 2025. But yeah, they're, they're all different. And that's why the, the acquisition strategy, which predated me at the company, um, was, was set up the way that it was, because these are, these are fast growing categories. So another thing maybe to mention is that the average consumer category is Procter Gamble and Unilever, the Pfizer consumer where I used to work is low single digits. They may be in a good year, three to 5% growth. These categories in the health and wellness space are growing nine to 15%. And this, so that's why they were so um, attractive for Nestle beyond kind of the strategic move into nutrition and, and healthcare that Nestle's making from food primarily, um, but they're also fast growing categories. And then I have a second question for myself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nestle Health and Science recently launched the GLP1 Nutrition.com website, a resource aimed at supporting consumers using GLP1 medications like Ozempic on their weight loss journeys. Given Nestle's origins in the food industry, some consumers may question the authenticity and value of this initiative. How does your marketing strategy address these concerns to build trust and demonstrate the company's commitment to generous, genuine wellness solutions? Yeah. Another great question. Great ask, guys. So I saw some of these questions in the preview, but they're all great questions. So I would say at a macro level, how does how does the company that um, markets itself Nesquik for years and years and years have credibility in health and wellness? And so um, we could talk about this probably for an entire class, but as we've made these acquisitions, we don't focus as much on the Nestle branding. So we've talked about Procter & Gamble a couple, a couple of times. You don't hear much about Procter & Gamble outside of kind of the stock price and the investor community. You hear about the brands. And it's, it's really been about the brands and how they've grown and the innovation strategies behind them and so forth. So that's how we think more. We think brand first more than company first. That said, there is a real opportunity that we need to continue to do a better job with around bringing the science and technology aspects that have made Nestle the number one food and beverage company and food science company around the world. We make baby food, we make coffee, we do make frozen food, we do make confection, but now we also make all of these health and wellness products as well. So there is a credibility thing that um, we've had to work through as, as health science is kind of the most, I would say, well, certainly the most health oriented part of the Nestle big portfolio. Um, yeah, but there are questions about, hey, you've made confections for a long time, but I think the strategy that Nestle has um, you know, followed has been really to move more into the, the wellness space and, and nutritional health space, if that makes sense. Yeah. And then on GLP-1 specifically, so GLP-1s are the class of drugs for Ozempic and, um, and the other kind of um, aggressive weight loss treatments. Um, with those treatments, we have a lot of data and a lot of science around the fact that there are significant side effects for a vast majority of the populace that are taking those drugs, right? So if you think about when you're losing a lot of weight, you're losing muscle mass, right? And so we have leading protein brands like uh, the Garden of Life and uh, Vitoproteins and Boost Protein Shakes um, and other brands in our portfolio are very heavy on Orgain is another brand in our portfolio that's heavy on protein. So as a companion to the GLP-1 users and frankly, the healthcare professional uh, that is 
prescribing the GLP-1 medications to their patients are looking for ways, because again, the, the, they're not just looking to prescribe these drugs, they're looking, for the, they're looking at the overall health and wellness and well-being of their patients. Um, so whether it's gut health or whether it is uh, micronutrient deficiency or whether it is protein deficiency, we have leading products that fit those voids, if you will. Um, and more and more, as more people are, are you know, getting onto those drugs, um, more and more we are seeing that there are real needs for these um, kind of supplements, right? Opportunity to, to fill some of the gaps that are being created by the, by the GLP-1s. And so it's not a, uh, we don't have a specific um, brand yet that is focused on GLP-1s. We're using our existing portfolio. And frankly, uh, Nestle USA in the foods division has created some products that are that are targeted at those users as well, that are higher in protein, higher in micronutrients, um, and so on and so forth, because there are some real concerns and side effects with those. All right, well, thank you. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. I'm in the hot seat. Every day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my question, we touched on it before, but um, with consumer demand shifting towards personalized nutrition, and functional foods. How is Nestle Health Science evolving its product line to meet up with consumers' preferences? Yeah, I, I, um, this is one of the great, great questions that I saw in the pre read as well. I actually, um, a couple of days ago, and maybe I'll send it and you guys can distribute it. We have a really, um, for me, compelling article at the Nestle, well, I keep referring to Nestle Group, which is all of Nestle. You think about kind of the Swiss headquarters, which is, we have foods, coffees, waters, uh, health science, which is our division. Um, Nespresso, which is their headquarters based in New York, the U.S. is headquarters here based in New York. Um, one of the, um, and it was, I think, from one of the questions you're asking as well in terms of scale leadership across Nestle divisions, it may be a good way to answer the question. But there's a great article that I just read from our chief technology officer at the company at the group level on protein and how we are uh, innovating and working with partners in the protein space across just about every division. Um, and they're learning more and more about protein. Protein's kind of hot right now, is whether you're thinking about weightlifting. It always kind of in my generation was more about protein was like protein powders for weightlifters. Um, I think we're seeing more and more that protein is a really important part of your nutritional kind of regimen and, and diet, of course. And so when we think about Nesquik or we think about lean cuisine or we think about our entire portfolio of health and wellness, there's a lot of innovation and a lot of science that we are sharing across the division to bring the right um, products and services. I think of the GLP1Nutrition.com as more of a service. It's not a true product so much as it is a service to consumers. And so we, we have done things in the personalized health space um, previously. Um, we don't have today, and we, I will just say, we've, we've looked at, I think, other um, pharma companies and other uh, vitamin companies have looked at kind of you know, personalized uh, based on your taking a quiz or taking some kind of survey, and we will turn around and send you back out personalized vitamins. We have tested that, and, and we've actually rolled it back a bit because what we found is that consumer behavior is more they want to pick and choose their own rather than be kind of given a, a personalized package. I'm trying to think of a, of a parallel. If you go to, you know, if I go to get my hair cut, right, they're going to give me a specific, you know, set of shampoos and things that I would use for, uh, styling and so forth. So we have done that, but we've moved a, a bit away from that because we think the consumer experience is more about um, essentially making their own decisions in real time. Thank you so much. Well, thank yeah. you. Thanks. I wish you guys, you guys can call me Brian. I feel like <laughs> Mr. Roger, like Mr. Brian's. <laughs> uh, firstly, thank yeah. you for joining us. My name is Daniel, and my question is, with multiple brands like uh, Nutrisource, Fiber, Guard, and Fiber Choice, offering similar gut health products. So how does Nestle Health Science market these uh, options to complement rather than competitors? Yeah, similar to the question earlier about vitamins. So we have a number of fiber-oriented uh, products. Um, candidly, a couple of them are being discontinued. So we can focus more on the ones that are that are performing really well. But I think for, for you guys, it all goes to, if you work in a large organization that has a portfolio of, of products, whether they're in the same category, they're across categories, we talk a lot about portfolio health and portfolio strategy, which means different investment levels based on different um, growth opportunities with the different brands. And so we have, um, we have a, a, 
Uh, many companies will will refer to these. Maybe this is the generic version. We have a different nomenclature, which I probably won't share here. But we're we'll talking about growth brands, maintenance brands, what we call harvest brands. So the growth brands are your big brands that are performing really well. You think um, I'll make it up. You think Dove, or you think um, you know, in our case, uh, a growth brand would be a Vital Proteins or a Garden of Life or a Nature's Bounty. The maintenance brands are the ones that you don't expect a whole lot of growth from, but you want to kind of maintain your market share position. They play a, a strategic role in your mix with the retail community. They may be more profitable for the retail community, um, and that's why you know they exist. It's a little bit like good, better, best, as I was talking about earlier. And then harvest brands are the ones where you know in most cases, and there's sometimes it's a fourth uh, category where. Um, we talk about transformation. This brand may be really kind of under the radar that hasn't performed very well. Maybe it's a good one to spin off or, or sell. Someone else in private equity might do a better job with it than we could because it would be a higher priority. So we, we sometimes have a transformation uh, grouping as well. But the harvest grouping is really about, you know, how can we maximize the profitability? And, and how can some of the harvest business performance support the growth of the, the, the big brands, if you will, the, the, the growth-oriented brands? And so that's that's hard because um, you know you love all your brands, you love all your children. You don't want to <laughs> categorize them in a certain way. Um, but if you haven't, uh, we used to say this a lot at Facebook. Um, but uh, the CEO of Netflix, uh, Bill Hastings, used to talk about um, you know strategy is pain. You have to make hard choices in strategy. And so yeah, portfolio strategy has been difficult because the people that work on some of the brands that aren't the growth brands. You know, want to grow them and want to, and that's part of their job is to grow them and is to. But but we're getting better and better about um, you know having the 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 ones in the different positions on the portfolio strategy play the right roles. <laughs> so you would um, KPI someone, you would you know reward someone based on their ability to generate profit if you are in the harvest or maintenance space more so than you would when you're in the growth space. The top line growth would really be the the performance indicator for the top line. So that's not so specific to those three brands. The reality is, you know, we're 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 going to have a growth brand in fiber. We'll probably have a ma uh, a maintenance brand in fiber. But that's true of any big portfolio of detergents. You know, you name it, up and down the consumer goods spectrum. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I have a question. My name is Mula. My question is also um, Alibaba also have a similar question. Okay. And that is in a tightly regulated industry like the medical industry and colleges, Nestle, the ones the affecting marketing with the strict regulatory. Yeah, it's it's a great question. Um, you guys ask some really, really I think smart and on point questions because it's all the things we deal with every day, whether it's portfolio strategy, you know, uh, homeland demand spaces as we were talking about so you're not competing with yourself um, and similar to the CFO question our legal and regulatory standard because we're a big publicly traded company a huge publicly traded company is very high so the standard for our the claims that we make and the way that we market is naturally going to be higher than it will be for um, a brand that is a startup and, and doesn't have the same level of risk if it were to be sued candidly or to be given a, uh, a consent decree from the FDA, which is what happens in the, the healthcare space. You may have read about some of that. So back to partnership and enrollment. Um, it's funny. I can. I can. If I had um, uh, Barbara Sanchez is the chief uh, legal counsel, and she she leads a lot of our um, our regulatory teams as well. If she were sitting right here, she would say we have a true partnership in that we enroll the lawyers, we enroll the regulatory leaders, and the medical leaders, which is another part of the healthcare space, um, in our um, communications development very early in the process and in our, in our innovation plans, our packaging and so on and so forth very early in the process so that they can be um, good about highlighting for us what the watchouts are. And there are a lot, especially in supplements. It's, it's a little cleaner in other healthcare categories. In supplements, it's less clean because you don't have the same regulatory oversight. So different classes of regulatory oversight in the US and it differs by country as well. So that's another thing to think about too when you have a global business like ours. So every country is different and there are different classes of, of, um, of regulatory kind of standard. So supplements is of the three in healthcare, the loosest, which means that there's a lot more, um, th there's a lot more kind of um, flexibility, if you will, in how some companies go about making claims um, around healthcare, improving their health and so forth. 
We have a higher standard. Some some of the other companies that we compete with also have a very high standard because they come from big companies. Unilever has a number of big uh, healthcare and supplement uh, brands now that they've acquired. So they would be in a similar position. So you have to be really creative, I guess, is the answer to the question. And you have to be in, um, in lockstep with your partners across the organization. Because if we went out um, and even, you know, you guys know this really well. We talked about TikTok a few minutes ago. If we had someone in the marketing department put something out onto TikTok or onto Instagram or, or even anywhere else um, that was not cleared or was not, uh, if we did not understand the risks associated with something like that, there's a lot of accountability um, around that. And so I guess what I would say is, as you are considering your careers going forward, some people um, like the big company um, scale uh, and the opportunity to work with, you know, Amazing, you know, talent. There's amazing talent in small companies as well. But um, I, I've sometimes said that because uh, I've worked in large companies and smaller companies, it does take a unique kind of attitude and mindset to work in a big company because you have to be patient and you have to be creative. It's a different level of creativity than working in a startup where you wear a hundred hats and anything goes. And so, yeah, I, I could argue kind of both sides of it, but I, I've had good success and partnering with the, the leaders in all of the functions, whether it's the CFO, the head of sales, the head of medical and regulatory, um, to make sure that we're doing the right things, right? And that we are uh, kind of abiding by the standards that Nestle um, very rightly holds us to. Okay, you're welcome. Hi, uh, my name is Raina. Hi, Again, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, today. Um, so I know that Nestle has a commitment to net zero emissions and the general region of agriculture. So how do they how do they ensure that sustainability initiatives create value for both stakeholders and shareholders? That's a, another great question. Um, so the sustainability team for health science in the U.S. Uh, reports into me. So what that means is that we now have sustainability on the prioritized kind of roadmap and strategy for um, the leadership group across SD Health Science, um, rather than have it in supply chain or an R&D or somewhere else that won't, won't kind of have a seat at the table. So Nestle as an organization, um, again, sees itself as a leader and has a responsibility to um, lead in areas of sustainability. Our business um, in health science is um, certainly following suit. We have a different business because we manufacture differently and we have acquired these 18 different brands. So they've all come in with different ingredient profiles, packaging claims, packaging materials as well. I was saying to George at the beginning of, uh, of today, so Vital Proteins is one of our brands to give you a sustainability uh, milestone that we just made. We've transitioned all of the Vital Proteins blue tub, which is collagen powder, um, from plastic into paper. So if you think about Quaker Oats and the paper canister there, um, we're now transitioning, I think we're 95% of the way to, to full transition into paper at this point. Um, and so that's um, something we're really proud of and something we take very seriously. Um, there's always a question on, hey, how important is sustainability to consumers and is it going to be a reason? Because it's not inexpensive to change out of plastic and into paper, as an example, right? So a lot of just change over logistics that have to take place. The materials in some cases may be more expensive, but we make those investments because we believe it's the right thing to do for the business. We think it's the right thing to do for the world. Um, it, the, the customers, I mentioned earlier, the retail community um, has put a lot of um, good and important pressure on the manufacturers to come up with sustainable um, achievements or sustainable uh, programs to, to bring more kind of, um, you know, again, recyclable, sustainable uh, materials into their stores so that they are also participating here. Um, so yeah, so it's a, it's high on our, uh, it sits right, we, we have an operating master plan, our OMP, and sustainability, it's a one-page document that we all use, it should be on everybody's desks or phones or screens somewhere, um, and sustainability is squarely in the middle of that, um, of all of the things that we do, whether it be marketing, whether it be packaging, so actually, um, the woman that leads the team, uh, her name is Christian Baker, would say, um, our three big pillars are um, packaging, um, ingredients, um, so raw materials, if you will, operations, so how we think about the facilities where we are making all of these, and Nestle has thousands of facilities around the world. And then I add the fourth one, which is marketing, and how we how we communicate the things, the investments that we're making. So those are kind of the four pillars of the sustainability strategy. And some of the, the targets are a little further out, they're kind of 2030, so zero greenhouse gas emissions is 2030, 
objective for the company. And we're on track to, to hit that, but it is, um, you know, there's there's a lot, uh, there's a lot in there that's complicated because we've just gone through an election here in this country. So the government has different perspectives on how we're gonna think about sustainability going forward, but we're, we're on a really good path. And Nestle, the company is absolutely leading at a global level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course, thanks for asking. And Sasha will show the screen and Michael, yeah. As Michael comes, I would like to show you guys a slide. So uh, once I was an international student, like many of you, and what we do in these classes, we have this concept of name and shame on the left hand side. <laughs> Companies that do hire international students, highlighted in yellow is Nestle, and on the red hand side, you have companies that don't hire international students. And we do invite them to the class, right? And then we uh, typically, you know, the speaker would say, yeah, I'll go back to my team and recommend that we hire international students as well. So that's it. Thanks, Asher. Okay. Thank you, Brian, for joining us today. Yeah. My name is Michael, and uh, mm -hmm. I'm here representing a group of international students, including Abdullah Benin, Tulani Mavitz, Harsh Parag, and many other international students that sit with us in the room and on Zoom as well. We're curious about Nestle's approach to hiring and integrating international students into its workforce. Mm. Specifically, we'd love to know how Nestle values the unique contributions of international students to brand strategy and consumer insights. Additionally, we'd love to know <laughs> if there's any specific programs or opportunities to help us transition effectively into the global marketing roles. Yeah. Great question. I'm actually surprised by your do's and don'ts slide that, that companies like Lauder and P&G would say that they don't hire yeah. international students. So I wonder, I saw the footnotes there. We can get into that. I'm yeah. curious yeah. What, that is, what those footnotes actually say. So the short answer is I'm glad to see Nestle Group on the list as a yes, that we do hire international students. Um, our team does hire international um, candidates, I'll say. Not always students, but students would be part of the candidate pool as well. Um, we don't have any that I'm aware of, but I will get back to you all and I'll do it to the professor here on, on programs specific to um, international um, kind of um, roles and, and, and kind of building a pipeline of international candidates. What I will say is that in our case, and, and some of the, the companies listed, many of the companies listed up there as well, we do have um, a global footprint from a brand perspective. And so um, we actually, <laughs> One thing that I'll just mention, I hadn't thought of this until just now, is that we have had um, U.S. leaders, so about 70% of our business in health science, just our division, is U.S.-based. That's largely because we haven't grown the acquisitions outside of the U.S. just yet. So my hope, even though I'm a U.S. leader today, um, my hope is that that moves more towards 50% 50, 50 in the U.S. and 50% outside of the U.S. because we think the growth opportunity for the business outside of the U.S. is very significant. So there are local, this is the way I, that I think about roles. You asked about global roles. There are local roles in every market where we operate around the world. Um, there are lead market roles, which I would consider the US to be for our portfolio today because of the size and scale of the business here. And then there are global roles, right? So think about global roles, what does that mean? And I was in a global role. The first global role that I was in in my entire career was when I joined Facebook in 2014. And so the global um, responsibility there was to, in, in a lot of ways, and I think this is true of global roles at Nestle as well, is to capture what's working really well in what markets, uh, what can be um, exported to other markets. And frankly, I think of the US as an export, probably export first because we're such a big part of the business, but also an import market as well across Nestle Health Science. So I wanna know what's working for Pure encapsulations or Solgar. Actually, Solgar I mentioned earlier is one of the vitamin brands is bigger outside of the U.S. than it's than it is within the U.S. within our portfolio. So a lot of the insights, a lot of the creative development, frankly, for a brand like Solgar comes from other markets, and we take advantage of that here in the U.S. And the reverse is true for a lot of our portfolio. But in my in my global role and the team that I worked alongside uh, at Facebook, we were really about code, what we called codifying best practice. So thinking about the things that we could do or we could share across the um, different business units across the different markets who often, unfortunately, don't speak to each other because they're really busy and it's it's hard to be that connective tissue. I'm not sure if you experienced this at, at P&G, but I imagine that you did. Um, so I think about being the connective tissue. I think about capturing what we used to call meta-analyses, not to confuse that with the name of the company, but meta being wide uh, analyses around what's working 
in what markets that other markets can take advantage of. And so those are really critical roles um, at Nestle um, across divisions. At places like Facebook have big global roles, places like Google have big global roles as well. So that's my best answer to your question. Specifically on Nestle or Nestle Health Science programs, I'm gonna have to come back to you on that. But we don't, um, I, I have never heard, I've been at Nestle for about 15 months, I've never heard of us discriminate based on international versus local candidacy, right? In fact, your, I think maybe what's inherent to your question is there's a lot of really important um, kind of experience and cultural you know, uh, diversity, if you will, that can be brought into these businesses. And I think of the US as important and expert. If there's a to show the next slide, please. Okay. So um, we're going to show you something that we did in this class as well. And we created a company which is not part of NYU. It's a non for profit, a non for profit, sorry, it's called NYUtrust.com. And so what we will do for companies like Nestle, we will be able to get your really best students to start tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Imagine that you have a problem and you need temporary help and so on. If you call us today, you have one of these best students. Now, to be, you know, to join this uh, organization is open to everyone. What we will tell employers is what our students were doing the last summer, right? They were asked, are you willing to work on weekends? Yes. Are you willing to work after hours? Yes. Uh, one of our students, 100% of them got a return offer. So some of them were like, for example, commuting for hours to go back to work every single day. Yeah. So you guys get the best of the best. Mm -hmm. um, it's a non-for-profit, so all what we do is we, we do this on a voluntary basis, and I encourage any company that is joining this video to reach out to us and get some of these very best students. And with that, Emma, you have a next question. That's great, thank you. Yeah? Hi, thank you so much for and answering the questions. I'm Emma. Nice to meet you. Thank you. And, and my question is, what would you say is the one quality that helps you reach such a high role as a CMO? And do you have any tips for students aspiring a similar path to follow a similar path? Yeah. So the CMO role today is, you know, I think quite different than it was previously so much because as we talked about earlier, it's much more commercially oriented. When I was kind of coming up, CMOs were, were known as the most creative people on the teams. I don't think of myself as the most creative person on our team or um, maybe even at our leadership group and maybe I shouldn't say that uh, out loud. But, um, but I think there's a real commercial orientation to how I've always thought about the CMO role, which is as we were talking about earlier, the partnership with the CFO around ensuring or demonstrating that the, that the marketing investments are driving growth. And so thinking of marketing as a growth engine as opposed to a, a cost center, if you will, which I think in a lot of cases historically has been a bit of the case, right? You're investing in brands for long-term kind of health of these brands, but in the year when you're responsible for financial performance, um, those two don't always match up. And so I've one of the things that I've always tried to, to focus on is being uh, a quite good um, commercial leader and, and really focused on if it's not impacting the forecast of the business, then I don't want to prioritize it. I kind of today I think about um, kind of two metrics are we improving the forecast or not mm -hmm. uh, when we're making decisions, or and or are we improving the strategy? So you may be making some longer term mm -hmm. investment decisions in capabilities. Um, Today, we're not great with um, the creator economy. We, we don't do a, a enough well with creators that are you know, uh, really helping brands grow in places like TikTok and Instagram and elsewhere. Um, so we're making an investment there. We need to make an, a greater investment in transforming how we um, acquire and synthesize data and technology. So some of that is, is going to be costly, but if you can um, demonstrate um, the commercial benefit of those investments. I think that's really something that I've tried to orient myself in. The other thing that I say to a lot of my teams, and I'll come back to that, I mentioned this at the very beginning, um, you'll hear brand management and you'll hear marketing used interchangeably a lot across a lot of organizations like Nate George. That happens at Procter Gamble, it happens at Nestle, it happens almost everywhere. And the reality is, this is what I say a lot to my team to this day, that brand management is um, almost by definition general management which means you're involved in a lot of things. Maybe you're an inch kind of deep, but you're a bit of a mile wide. And I used to say, if you're in a meeting room with other leaders or other people, other peers uh, on, the, on the business team, 
And you look around, you see the finance team, you see the legal team, you see the sales team, you see the supply chain team or the regulatory team or the HR team. Every one of those groups that I just mentioned are deep, deep specialists. They spend 80 plus percent of their time thinking about their functional specialty and brand managers spend about 80% of their time trying to think about everything. So I come back to this point of being deeply specialist. So what I try to remind myself, which is yes, you know, maybe because we're control freaks, we want to be involved in every part of the business. That's the brand management or general management um, kind of orientation. But if you're not a specialist in driving demand, there's no better way to drive growth in a business. You can, you can load all the Nesquik onto the shelf, um, you know, and, well, I don't know what the right uh, grocery store is here is in the city any longer, but, um, you know, into the into Whole Foods, right? I don't know, yeah, Whole Foods probably doesn't carry Nesquik, but <laughs> you can load all the garden of life into, uh, into Whole Foods, but if it's not moving off the shelf, your growth is gonna stagnate. And so that's why I think there's no uh, more important growth driver than your marketing organization. Mm -hmm and you have to think about your specialty. So what I would say is, as you're telling your story to future employers and interviews, um, think about what your specialty is. And it doesn't have to be, hey, I'm, I'm really good at creator marketing, or I'm really good at, um, I'll make it up, you know, data and analytics, those are good things to be good at. But those, you don't have to solely be that. But if you, it's hard for me to get excited about hiring a true generalist, um, I want to hire specialists. Mm -hmm. And so I think if you think about generalist specialists, as you think about a career in marketing, um, it's hard because the other functions, as I mentioned, are true specialists. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason I mentioned brand management versus marketing, marketing is a specialty. But if you're a brand manager or in brand management, it is true general management. So you have to find ways to be uh, a specialist. Thank you very much. Yes, of course. Thanks for the question. And brains building on what Emma was saying for those uh, who are marketing and are thinking about general management, I think uh, I heard that you're some good news. Maybe you can share a bit more. Oh, yeah, my news. Yeah, so I am, I guess, in the spirit of general management, I'll have to figure out how to become a specialist again. So I'm moving into a new role um, on December 1st. Uh, so I'm going to be a business unit president for Nestle Health Science for about half of the year. Well, we came so originally, I said, well, we're going to come and talk specifically about marketing and my chief marketing officer role. And then when we were doing a, a, a quick kind of check-in uh, on readiness for today, I mentioned that this has just been announced internally uh, over the last couple of weeks. So yeah, I'm excited about that. It means, you know, moving from kind of more of a marketing focus to a holistic focus, I'll have responsible for, I'll have responsibility for um, all of the financial performance and partner with the, you know, the sales and finance and supply chain organization and the marketing organization. Um, to essentially portfolio manage our way to, to meeting our targets, exceeding hopefully our targets. Um, and yeah, it's exciting. So uh, we have great brands in the portfolio. It's a, uh, it's a great business, as I said, we were in high growth categories um, when you think about consumer goods. And um, we have a terrific team and a terrific kind of, um, I would call it backbone or infrastructure and Nestle with a lot of learning. We need to do a better job, I think, of some of the question earlier about globalization of the team, but we need to do a better job of um, even within the U.S., of learning what the pet food business does really well, what the coffee business does really well, um, we're, we're close to some parts of the business. So I'm quite close to the uh, the person that leads marketing for Nespresso because they're doing a lot of really interesting things in um, e-commerce and with creators and so forth. So we have a lot of parallels. We actually have a partnership between Nespresso with Vital Proteins because Vital Proteins is actually the single greatest or biggest use case for Vital Proteins is in coffee. So there's a natural partnership there that we're doing more with. But one of the things um, that I'm going to try to do a better job of in this new role is learning from um, some of the other leaders across Nestle business units beyond health science. Great. So I think, you know, it's congratulations, but also that shows, yeah, all the, all the career and all the network you have. I would like to, so, uh, so that you guys know that you're not taking the class, we do all these ourselves, right? Everything. And I would like to thank some of the students who were working on this. Um, Habiba and Said, that if you guys will stand up, they were the ones promoting everything. And I would like to thank some of the students who were working on this. Um, Habiba and Said, that if you guys will stand up, they were the ones promoting. Uh, where's Habiba? Oh, there is Said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Flyers, yeah. 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 Uh, Diana was uh, with Paola, you know, the video and the forest. 
think both Sasha and Crystal were helping with the coordination. And now we get something that we did for you. Now maybe Sasha, you want to play um, from this computer or You've joined a live finance for marketing decisions class at NYU School of Professional Studies. In our class, we select a Fortune 500 company to learn about finance by making decisions on pricing, headcount, marketing, and profitability. CFOs and CMOs from Disney, Coca-Cola, and McDonald's have joined us to respond to questions from the audience. All speaker sessions are free and open to everyone. And today, over 50 students got together to say, Thank you, Mr. Groves. This is a great opportunity for us students. Merci pour cette chance, Monsieur Groves. Conocemos los trabajos prácticos. Estamos ansiosos por ese día. De Montreal. A la France. De Italia. A República Dominicana. A México. Do Brasil. To Canada. Menos. De Chipria, Palimindeli. To Canada. Para Talk. Se vale. Then Indonesia. Tao Zhongguo. Tao Zhongguo. Thank you, Mr. Groves.